equipment with Sunday school classes. We've got a nursery in the back. We've got a baptism pool. We've got a fellowship hall. We've got a parsonage. We've got more land over here. We've got all this stuff. We've got all this room that we can do something with. What are we doing with it? 131 years God's been good to this place. 131 years God has blessed this place. Over the last two months though, I don't know if you know it or not, God has been indwelling in this place. You can't help it. If you don't feel it, you need to get saved. Hey, I'm glad sometimes I can just feel God. Amen. Now, I don't go on based on my feelings. I go based on faith. But I like it when I can walk into a building and feel the holy presence of a just, mighty God in this place like I have over the past few months. God's doing something special in hearts. God's doing something special in lives. I, I know we got people traveling this morning. I know we got people sick this morning. But God's doing something special in this place, and I'm thankful for that. I can't explain it. If you've been here, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just different. Uh, it's just a different atmosphere. It's like God's just dwelt with us for a little while and I don't ever want Him to leave. God's doing big things. God's been moving in ways that only He can. Uh, the preacher can't make things happen. You can't make things happen. I can't bring tears to your eyes and make you want to shout and make you want to testify. But there is one that can and that's God and that's exactly what God's been doing over the past few months. If ever a church stood in a position to move forward for God, it's this one. If God's going to do something big, He's going to do it right here. Amen. I believe it with all my heart. God's got something big planned for Webb's Chapel Baptist Church. Can I tell you that our greatness is not measured by success? How great of a church it is, is not measured by its success. A lot of people think if you've got a big old church building and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's grand and they think that's success. That's not success. I know a lot of me and Chris, we go to a lot of churches. We go to some small and we go to some big and every one of them are empty. Can I tell you this morning, we've got more people in Webb's Chapel Baptist Church this morning with the small crowd that we have than most of the churches that me and Chris go to. That shows you God's in this place. God's in this place. Greatness is not measured by wealth or success. You can have a large bank account, have a large building fund, have a large uh, uh, this and a large that, and just because you've got a lot of money in the bank does not mean that you are successful as a church. Right. We've got that, and I'm thankful for that. We've got money. God's been good to us. God's blessed this church over the past 131 years, but that doesn't mean that we've been successful just because we have a large bank account or because our garden, our, our the yard looks good and that, that, that's not what a successful church is about. Uh, it seems like we're moving up, up, up. It seems like over the past few months, God's been adding to the church. God's been blessing the church. In about two weeks, we're going to baptize. We're going to open up the church doors to more people to join if they want to join. Seems like over the past, it's just like God's been sending visitors in and, and, and people in. And it seems like God's just dwelling in this place. And we keep on going up. We keep on going up. We keep on going up. We're just inching our way up to glory, inching our way up to, to something big. But something's keeping us from going over the top. Yes. Amen. Something is keeping us from going over the top here at Webb's Chapel Baptist Church. What is that? This church has potential. I'm getting ready to prove it to you in just a second. This church has the people. Hey, we got, what, about 50 people here this morning, something like that? And half the crowd ain't even here. We got quite a bit of people here. I might be over exaggerating a little bit. But we got a big crowd here this morning for a Sunday morning when you go out and you see churches that have closed down and there's no big people in those churches. Hey, we got the people. That ain't a problem. We've got the people here at Webb's Chapel Baptist Church. We've got good Bible teaching. Hey, I stand for Chris and Clyde. They'll teach you. Amen. Miss Pat Hebner will teach and Miss Joy will teach. And Miss Merle, didn't you teach this morning? Didn't I? That's what I thought. I saw you sitting there. Miss Merle will teach. And we got Sunday school Miss Vivian and Miss Shirley will teach the kids. And hey, Rose is teaching children's church and teaching the kids. And, and, and I teach the teenagers. Brother Jimmy and Jason filled in for them this morning. Hey, we've got plenty of teachers. we got plenty of people to do the work. And we're getting good Bible teaching. Brother Chris and Jimmy both said that the Sunday school lessons over the past uh, month or so has been great. God's been using God's best lessons that they've had in a while. Hey, we've got good Bible teaching here. 
yet something seems to be lacking. Yeah. Something seems to be lacking. <clears throat> I've thought about it, and 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 I've come up with some ideas this morning that you and I, notice I said you and I as pastor of this church, I am the leader, therefore I need to examine my heart just as much as anybody else. So we need to examine our hearts this morning and figure out what's keeping us from going over the top for the Lord. I've come up with some ideas that I want us to examine. And I want to preach on this thought. How do we keep our church on course? Seems like we're on course. Now, after we've been here for a little over a year and a half, I believe our church is on the course that it needs to be. I, I believe it's, it, 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 we're going in the direction that God wants. I believe that, that most of us, about 90% of us, are in the mindset that we want God to do something big here. Amen. That we got the majority on, on working the church and, and the direction that it needs to go. We're in unity. I believe that, most of us. We're in unity. We want a certain direction for this church, and that's the direction that God wants it to go. And we're in that direction. Now, how do we keep it that way? How do we keep it that way? Well, first, we've got to realize, and I'm getting ready to prove to you how much potential this church has. In Lincolnton, North Carolina, by the way, that is our, our city. That is where our address for our church is located. There are 11,352 people in Lincolnton, North Carolina. I looked this up this week. In Christ, that's just right here beside of us, two seconds down the road, there are 322 people. In Cherubble, it's 10 minutes up this way. You get to the Walmart, you're in Cherubble. Five. Five minutes. <laughs> 6,132 people live in Cherubble. Five minutes. In Dallas, you go about 10 minutes up this way toward Dallas, North Carolina. You go up here to Dallas Cherubble Highway, you've hit Dallas, just about. There are 6,016 people. In High Shoals, you take Webb's Chapel, Gaston Webb Chapel Road down to the end of this road, about five or six minutes, you hit into High Shoals. And you know what? There's 599 people in high shoals. Wow. That means, are y'all ready for this? There are 24,421 people within 20 minutes of our church. Wow. That's the potential that our church has. That's the potential. If we really got dedicated, and I believe God can do it, we could have 24,000 people here at this church. Some of you are like, and you know what? When I think of that, I'm like, that's a scary thought. That's a big church. We're used to a little church. We're used to a small church. Better not be used to it long. God's getting ready to grow this place. If you want a small church, you better find you one because it ain't going to be small for long. <laughs> I give this thing 10, 15 years, we're going to be growing up to max. That's my vision. I believe God's getting ready to do something big for us. You better get in line with it or go find you a small church where you can stay happy because uh, you say, well, you're crazy. God put me here for a specific reason. Amen. And that thing... That reason will be accomplished. Amen. If we reach these people, it will be because we've reached them on purpose. We're not going to reach 25,000 people by accident just by walking the streets and not doing anything. If we're going to reach them, if the church is going to grow, we're going to have to do it on purpose. It's not going to be by accident. They're not just going to walk in here. They're not just going to fall in place. It's going to be on purpose. Amen. Amen. If we're going to fulfill what God has in store for Webb's Chapel Baptist Church, we must do some things that God has commanded us to do. What do we need to do to go over the top, Webb's Chapel? Number one, we must have prayer. We must have prayer. If this church is going to succeed, we must be a people of prayer. I'm not just talking about praying over your food. I know that's what the majority of Christians do. They go to eat their lunch and they, they'll say, Lord God, bless this hot chicken sandwich before it messes my stomach up. <laughs> James is laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> then we'll, we'll pray, Lord God, bless this food, amen. And they do that about three or four times a day and that's the extent of their prayer life. I'm talking about getting along with God in your closet until he meets with you. When's the last time you've done that? You can look around here and you can say, well, this person ain't doing that and this person ain't doing that and this ain't getting done and that ain't getting done. When's the last time you stopped all that and prayed for a person? Prayed that that person would get the job done. Hey, you want to know what makes a difference? Prayer. Amen. You want to know what makes a difference? Prayer. You want to know how we're going to reach 25,000 people in the surrounding area? And by the way, that is the church's job. 
It's not just to come to church and eat and play and sing and have this and have that and woohoo. That's not the church's job. The church's job is to get lost sinners out of hell, get them into the house of God so that they can go out and get more lost sinners out of hell and bring them in so that they can go out and give. That's the job of the church. Right. If it was for us just to have a wonderful time, when we died, we'd have been gone out of here. We'd already be in heaven. There's no point living. Because you ain't going to have more fun down here than you ever will in heaven. Amen. Heaven's going to be a whole lot more fun, a whole lot more wonderful than this place. Life's not about having fun and eating and, and we do all those things because that's what they did here in the text. That's what the church does. We eat, praise God. We have a good time. But the main goal of this church should be to get people to Jesus. Right. Prayer is what it's going to take. I'm talking about, you want to know the difference between uh, the people of today and the people of yesterday? Men like Billy Graham, men like Billy Sunday, men like Jack Howells, men like, uh, I could keep on going and going and going. J. Frank Norris, there's so many preachers that had an impact, so many people that, that made a difference. Their prayer life is what made that difference. Their prayer life. It'll take prayer and sacrifice from every person in this church. <clears throat> If there's only one or two of us, or three or four of us, or five or six of us praying and actually seeking God's face for the for the direction that He wants this church to go, it's not going to happen. And can I tell you, if you're so consumed with your life that you never think about this church when you leave it, something is wrong. Right. Amen. Amen. You ought to be praying for this church every day. We don't just give out nice bulletins so that you can see the 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 the, the activities that we have going on. We have these bulletins printed off with a prayer list inside of them for you to specifically go down that prayer list and call out each individual that's on that prayer list. That's what each and every one of us ought to do. That's the kind of prayer life I'm talking about. You say, I don't have time for that. You better make time. If you want this church to grow, you need to make time for prayer. You say, I'm too busy. Hey, everybody's busy. you got to make time. When you get up in the morning, set your clock about 30 minutes early and spend 30 minutes with the Lord. That's exactly what you do. You, you say, well, I can't get up no early. You can. You just choose not to. Prayer is what it's going to take. We must come to God with a burdened heart and a caring heart. Most of the time, we'll say, oh, I'll pray for you. We'll say, I'll pray for you. But yet, we never do. It's just small talk to us. We'll say, oh, I, somebody's got a desperate need. I need you to pray for this. I need you to pray for that. Oh, yeah, I'll pray for it. And then you forget about it and you don't never mention it again. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important that you write these things down. Put them in your phones. Do whatever you got to do to remember the prayer request. Matthew 21, 22 says, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. You know what that verse said? If you ask, you'll get it. That's how much God loves us. That's how much God cares for us. So if we're asking for the Lord to take this church over the top, guess what he's going to do according to that verse? He's going to take it over the top. Uh, Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Not only is prayer praying, but prayer is believing that God's going to do it. You want to know why Miss Merle's blood pressure went down a couple weeks ago after Wednesday night? And you want to know why that happened? Because she believed God could do it. Because we believe God could do it. We came in unity together in one accord, and we prayed for a specific thing. Miss Joy, have you got word on your test results yet? On tomorrow. Tomorrow? Keep on praying for Miss Joy and her test results. That was another thing. We're still waiting on the result. Some prayers. Hey, I'm thankful that instant prayers, Miss Brother, get answered the day after, right? I'm thankful for that. I'm talking about her blood pressure was high in the 200s. And we pray one time as a church in unity and one accord. And the next day we get a phone call, Miss Faye on the prayer chain. Hey, Miss Brother's blood pressure is the lowest it's been in months. You know what? That's God. Amen. Miss Joy standing here today after God. It's God. That's us praying in unity. That's what happens when we do that. John 14, 13 through 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. God said, if you ask him for it, hey, I'll give it to you. The problem that we have is we're satisfied without it. We've become, and the Old Testament word, eased in Zion. We're content with the way things are. We're content with the number that we have. We're content with nobody getting saved. Hey, I'm thankful we've had at least 15 people saved in the past year and a half. We're getting ready to baptize a few more that got saved. You know what? We're content with that. We ought not to be. 
We ought to be wanting and begging God to do something more. Wanting and begging God to grow this place and to make it more than it actually is. John 5, 14 through 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. He said, if you ask me and it's in my will, I'll give it to you. So if we ask him to grow this church, and we know it's God's will to grow this church, because that's the point of the church being here. That's why God placed it here. So if we ask God and pray to God on a daily basis, on a certain time, every single day, you know what God's going to do? God's going to take his place over the top. Amen. God's going to take his place over the top. This is a lifestyle of constant prayer. I'm talking about, you do realize that this building that we're in, it can't say a prayer. It can't pray. This building can do nothing for sinners. This building can do nothing to grow itself. Pianos. Hey, it'll make a real nice sound when April or Brooke or Tyler or, one of them, or whoever gets on it and they start playing that thing and they, they start making it sing. Hey, it sounds real wonderful. But you know what? If ain't nobody sitting there playing it, it ain't going to do nothing. It's going to sit there and do exactly what it's doing. Boy, it's late. I ain't even got past my first point. Furniture can't pray. Hey, these pews, they can't pray. There's nothing that they can do to get a sinner in here. There's nothing that they can do. If God's will for us is to reach people and see them saved, and we know that it is because the Bible teaches that, go ye into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. You want Bible on it? There's your Bible verse on it. Become strong disciples. It's going to take a sold out dedication of every person here. Amen. Not just two or three. Not just a few. We have not because we ask not. Number two, we must have persistence. Verse number 46, y'all look with me there again. It says, and they continuing daily. Continuing daily. Now, what does that mean? That means they was at the church every single day. Some of y'all get all bent out of the frame because we're having something once a while. We're having so much going on. That's the way the church is built. That's the way the church grows. People see the activities and people say, I want to take part in that. I think I'm going to go visit over there. And then they go and visit and they get involved. They get saved and things happen. You don't, you're not, we're not going to be able to build a church just on activities. But activities helps build the church. Y'all understand that. We're going to have to have persistence. Every day somebody was out doing something for God. They wasn't sitting at home watching Andy. They wasn't going out and doing this or going out and doing that and going here and going there. They were doing something for the Lord. That's why they saw thousands saved here in the book of Acts. Because they were busy and they were persistent. Persistence. That's the tough thing. When you when you when you get out of the habit, me and Miss Faye was talking before church. I ain't gonna get into all we said. But she said, when you get out of the habit of doing something, when that persistency stops, it's yeah. amazing, we just had that conversation. When the persistency stops, that's when you're going to fail. Yeah. That's when it gets easy to get out. You say, why do we have senior fellowships? Why do we have this? Why do we have that? Because I want to be persistently here with you. Because I want you growing with each other. You say, well, we can do that from home on the phone. That ain't the same. Amen. That ain't the same. You can call each other and I hate to say it, but it's true. And gossip. But that, that's not the same as coming into a building and fellowshipping with one another and praying for one another and being there with one another. Phone is not the same. Yeah. Every day, somebody was out doing something for God to reach people. Visiting, working, praying and helping others. That's persistence. Our, and I've got to hurry. Our persistence shows our concern. If we go to the doors in our community and we knock on those doors... <laughs> And we have that burden for them on our heart. And they see it in our face. You know what that shows? That shows them that we're concerned. Everybody that's went out soul winning since, since we've been out uh, a little over a year and a half ago. We try to go out once a month. We've kind of calmed down because it's too cold. And I don't want you seniors turning into ice cubes. So I, and I know some of you are faithful enough to do that. So i got to take care of your health as well. as i got to look out for the sheep. Amen. I can't just let people freeze to death. I know you will. But I can't let you do that. So we've kind of taken a break from it. But we try to go out once a month. When we go out and we knock on doors and we show them, hey, we want you at church. 
That makes a difference. Mm -hmm. That makes a difference. Because 90% of the churches are not doing that anymore. They're not. And that's why 90% of the churches have no people in them. <laughs> I mean, you don't show people that you care. Why would they want to be a part of your church? Right. Well, if they, you don't care about it, why would they care about it? Right. I mean, nobody, you know, they probably don't even know it's sitting here. They continued daily in the temple. That means they had something going on at the church every day. House to house. That means there was some type of church work going on in every single house. You know, back then they did have church house churches. They would go to different people's houses and they would have a uh, church, church meeting in their houses instead of going into <coughs> actual buildings. But wherever the church is gathered, that's you have in church, amen? That's persistence. Why do we have revivals? To keep us persistent. Why do we have vacation Bible school? To keep us persistent. Why the senior fellowships? Why the marriage class? Why this? Why that? Why has he got to do so much? Because I'm trying to get some persistence in this place to get you to want to come into the house of God and stay there for a little while. That's why. Persistence. We shouldn't want to come in this place and as soon as the preacher says amen, boom, we're gone. Amen. That's the problem in a lot of churches. they got drag racing going on. Right. They'll drag in five minutes before service starts. Yeah. Oh, it's so awful. I wish I didn't have to come to church. Because mm -hmm. I had to get out of the bed and I had to comb my hair and I had to do this and I had to do that. And you complain the whole way here and you're cussing your kids out and fighting with your husband and fighting with your wife. Then you get here five minutes right before church. And then nobody talked to me. Well, if you got here more than five minutes before church starts, somebody would talk to you. And then after church, as soon as the preacher says amen, says amen and boom, I'm gone. And then they wonder why nobody ever talks to him. Mm -hmm. You say, that's awful. That's the truth. Amen. That's the truth. Yep. We drag in and we race out. We act like it's not important. 90% mm -hmm. of your Baptist churches today. Number three, I'm trying to hurry, y'all. It's only 12 o'clock. We need programs. The reason we have senior fellowships, men's meeting, ladies' meeting, craft parties, old-fashioned Sunday, vacation Bible school, fall festival, marriage class, is because it helps draw people in. If they don't know about, if they do know about these things, they'll come. Right. You don't know how many people have looked on our faces. Oh, that's encouraging. But here's the problem. If they're already going to another church, they're most likely not going to come to our church. Because normal people are faithful to their own church. Right. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Amen. Yes. You, yep. Mm -hmm. Real Christians love their church so right. much that they ain't going to go to another church. That's right. Because they love their church yep. and they're going to be faithful to their church. Yep. Amen. Well, I, mean, Amen. I said it twice, didn't I? <laughs> but if people that are lost know that we've got all these things going on, it'll draw them in here. It'll draw them in here. And you say, well, that ain't what they ought to come for. They ought to come for the Lord. I don't expect any lost person to come in here for the Lord. How is somebody that doesn't know the Lord going to want to be with the Lord? Yeah. They don't care nothing about God. They care about what's going on in the church. That's why you have these things. Mm -hmm. I know we say, and I've already said that, number four, we must have preaching. That's the most important thing out of all this is the preaching. We have it here. I ain't bragging on me. I'm saying every preacher I've had come through here has preached the Bible to you. They've not preached opinion. They've preached it right. They've preached the book. I hope you never get tired of preaching. Amen. I hope you never get tired of preaching. Preaching is the center of the gospel presentation. I don't mean just preaching on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm talking about I hope you never get tired of preaching on the job. You say, huh? Yeah, you do realize it's your job to preach to them when you're out there. That's what's going to draw them in. Your job. It's your job to preach at the job. It's your job to preach at school, teenagers. It's your job to give the gospel to those kids at school. Your friends ain't going to come if you don't never invite them. You don't never tell them about Jesus. They're not going to know about Jesus. Preaching wherever we go. If we're here, if we're there, we must preach in order to reach. How will they hear? Matter of fact, let me read it. I got it right here. Romans 10, 13 through 14. For whosoever, we love that verse, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God. I'm thankful for that. Anybody that wants to be saved can be saved. But there's another verse underneath that. It says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How do you expect people to know if you don't tell them? Right. Number five, we must have a plan. We must have a plan. I said it before, we're not going to reach 24,000 people by accident. We've got to have a plan. 
We will never grow larger than we plan to. If you're content with the church at where it's at, it's going to stay that way. It's going to stay that way. How are we going to reach 24,000 people? Growth will come on purpose <laughs> and by plan. Failure can and will not come by not planning. If you don't plan, you will fail. Everyday life, if you don't get up and say, I'm going to do this, you're not going to do it. Same way it is with building the church and with growing this church. I'd like to see us grow our youth department. I have a plan, y'all. I've got a vision. God's given me a vision for this church. I would love to see this basement down here full of young people. I'd love to see that. Some of you would love to see that. You've told me that. It's going to take the things that I'm talking about this morning for that to happen. I want that. I want it. I want this, this, this place to be thriving and, and filled. And, and I know it's been that way in the past, but those have done grown up. Yeah. They're adults. Yeah. you got to get new ones in. Like I said earlier, you got to be persistent. If you're not persistent with it, it dies. It dies. you got to get persistent. Uh, I'd like to see our middle age group grow between the ages of 25 to 40. We've got a lot of seniors, and I'm thankful for you. And I've told you this, and I'll tell you again, I wouldn't trade you for, for, for a church full of young people, but I want some young people. I want them. And we're going to get them, and God's going to give them to us. i got a plan. I've got a vision. They're not just going to walk in. We've got to go get them. We need a plan for the future. Our plans must include the reaching of every person that we can. We must reach them with God's message. If we can get the truth to sinners all around us, the truth will set them free. We must reach them with compassion. That's where most of us fail. We don't have any compassion. I talked about it two weeks ago when we preached on blind Bartimaeus. We drive by the homeless and we say, well, if they'd have a job, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be where they're at. And that's not compassion. That's not compassion. You see somebody fall in sin and you see them mess up their lives and they mess up their family's lives and you know what you say? Well, they deserved it. They're the ones that messed up. That's not compassion. We need to have compassion. I think of, uh, of, of Bobby. I love you. You wouldn't be here if nobody would pick you up, would you? No. Compassion. Alec, who brought you to church this morning? You wouldn't be here if she hadn't picked you up, would you? Compassion. You say, how are we going to feel? That's the way it's going to get filled. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's the way it's going to happen. And as I said last week, you say, oh, we tried that. It didn't work. That's because you didn't do it with persistence. Yeah. you got to try it again. Mm -hmm. you got to try it again. Persistence. 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 Jude, verse number, 20, 20, verse number 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. You say, oh, they've done this and they've done that. Have compassion. Forget it. Don't forget it. Just watch out for the signs that don't happen next time. Put it that way. Until we have compassion, we will not make a difference in our community. Number six, I got two more and we're going to the house. We must have people. If we're going to do anything, we got to have people. We got to have people that will lead. We got a lot of people. We don't have a lot of leaders. Not a lot of leaders. We got a lot of people that will go to somebody and say, why don't you tell them to do this? Well, why are you telling them to do it when the Lord laid it on your heart? Be a leader. Do it. Go to somebody and say, do you mind if I do this? Do you care? Can we do this? And do it. It's not the recreation committee's job to do everything. Right. It's not my job as the pastor to do everything. It's not the deacon's job to do everything. It's not the Sunday school teacher's job to make the Sunday school class. The whole Sunday school class ought to participate and speak up and talk. It, it, that's the way it is with the church. Everybody ought to have a place. We need more leaders. We need more leaders. If we're going to take this thing the way that the Lord wants it to go, we're going to have to get some leaders. We need some people that will be willing to do what needs to be done. we got a lot of people that fuss about a lot of things. But when's the last time you picked up something and changed it? You'll see tissue on the floor, and instead of picking it up, you'll go to somebody and say, hey, there's tissue on the floor. There's candy wrappers all in these chairs. These sorry rotten kids. Why don't you pick up the candy wrappers and keep that to yourself? Right. You know how many times I've cleaned the toilet up after you? Pastor of the church, cleaning the toilet. Had mess all over it. I ain't talking about kids. I'm talking about some of y'all. I threw my gloves on, and I cleaned up the mess, and I didn't say one word to you. Why can't you do that for some of these kids that are running right. around in here? Amen. Amen. 
People that are weak. When's the last time you weep for somebody instead of complaining about them? People that are work. We have workers. I'm thankful for that. We have y'all step in and step up. And we have givers at this church. I'm thankful for that. Every time we've had somebody come in, y'all have always took care of them. Y'all are givers and y'all are workers and y'all are lovers. But we all need to work on our compassion. We all need to work on our compassion. Number seven, and we're done. This is probably the most important out of all seven. If we don't have this. We're not going to have any of the other ones. We have to have power. We have to have power. And I ain't talking about power. We've had church without power here before. I'm talking about power of the Holy Ghost. We must get plugged into the power source of the Holy Ghost. You'll not get this power if you don't read your Bible. You're not going to get this power if you don't pray. You're not going to get this power if you don't go soul winning. We must have a purpose. Our purpose should be to live holy, to glorify God and reproduce fruit in our lives. Luke 19, 13, and everybody stand up. April or Brooke, one of y'all wants everyone to man. Come down to the piano. Luke chapter 19 and verse number 13, Jesus made a very famous statement, and this would sum this whole message up. He said, Occupy until I come. Occupy until I come. He didn't say sit there with your thumbs twiddling and wait until I come. He said, Occupy until I come. What are you doing for the Lord? What can you say that you've done for the Lord this week apart from coming to this service this morning? Don't answer that out loud. Answer it in your mind. Examine your hearts as I have examined mine already. I'm going to pray. You do as you feel led to do. If you want our church to go over the top, I suggest you come down here and pray this morning. Say, I don't feel like it. Say, I don't know if I can get back up. Pray where you're at. I suggest you pray. Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's pray.